Dr. Soro Armenian, who is at the City of Hope National Medical Center. He runs the Division of Outcomes in the Popula Department of Population Science at City of Hope at the Cancer Center there. Uh, his research focuses on understanding the long-term outcomes in cancer survivors. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about clonal hematopoiesis and its impacts on outcomes after autologous hematopoietic cell transplantation. So, Dr. Armenian, over to you. All right, so I do wanna say it's a special thrill um, to present um, to you all. Um, I, you know, the V Foundation has a remarkable track record of, of funding um, really interesting and innovative studies, and I feel truly privileged um, to have had our research um, funded through the V Foundation. It's also a special thrill um, to follow um, uh, Smita Bhatia, who has really been a pioneer and a personal mentor and who's really led the way for a lot of the work that we've been doing, um, as well as others um, who will be presenting today. So, so without further ado, um, I want to talk a bit about um, this concept that I think others will talk about later on today as well, is this emerging concept of clonal hematopoiesis. Um, it's, it's a long sort of a complex uh, set of words, but ultimately what we really are talking about is um, a research that's going to help understand why some people um, go through treatment without any issues and then others uh, face unique obstacles, uh, not just during the treatment, but uh, many years afterwards. So what I'm talking about today, are, are it's mostly about patients who have undergone um, a bone marrow transplantation. Uh, we call it hematopoietic cell transplantation. They're interchangeable, HCT. Um, so bone marrow transplantation really emerged um, in the 70s and 80s as a revolutionary and experimental approach to treating uh, patients who had very difficult to treat, uh, mostly uh, hematologic or blood cancers and lymphomas. Um, due to advances in treatment, uh, we have increased uh, both the indication and then the types of transplants that have been performed um, throughout the last several decades. So it's estimated currently in the United States, there's about 25,000 patients who undergo a bone marrow transplant. For, for many of these patients, this is a last resort option. Um, there are two types of transplants without getting into too much detail. Autologous stem cell transplantation or bone marrow transplantation is when you receive your own stem cells back after you receive uh, treatment. And then allogeneic is when you receive it from another uh, person, and that's probably the one you hear about the most. So, so as I mentioned, there are different types of transplants, um, and those transplant indications have increased, and the number of transplants performed in the United States have increased. Um, we also, due to better treatment strategies, we've had a much, uh, a very robust increase in the number of um, survivors. So uh, the slide on the, the, the graph on the right essentially shows the number of um, long-term survivors of transplantation and it's currently estimated about a quarter million survivors of transplant and then that number will double over the next 10 years. Um, so it's really a testament to the remarkable progress we've made in treating our patients. Next slide. But um, as the theme I think will emerge uh, from the conversations today is that, you know, this, this improvement in survival, it isn't always equivalent, it, it's come with, it comes with a cost. Um, and when you look at these individuals five plus years out, so once you make it past the transplant, you're a five year survivor. Uh, the reality is that your overall survival is substantially lower than what would be expected for the general population. And it's not the cancer itself that's causing that, the higher mortality or what we consider premature mortality in this group. As you can see in the blue, uh, blue figure, the blue graph, is that it's really non-disease related mortality that's increasing. And so when we look at the next, if you can advance, when we look at the causes of late mortality, this looks like a busy slide, but I think the general concept here is that black is disease-related mortality, so relapses and recurrences. And on the bottom, on the x-axis, you're seeing the further out you are from your, your transplant. What you're seeing, as you would expect, is that the cancer-related, recurrence-related mortality decreases. And this is overtaken by other types of um, cause, causes of mortality including aging related um, causes such as different types of cancers and cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, et cetera. And these survivors have a much higher proportion of what we consider early onset or aging related mortality. 
a premature mortality um, uh, accelerated aging type phenotype. Next slide. So this is just a very simplified figure of what we actually think is happening to many of our patients. And a lot of this really has to do with, um, as we study our patients, what we think happens is that during the treatment itself, uh, as you can see in the gray bars, um, there is a change in the trajectory in this aging process. So all of us have a normal physiologic reserve that sort of holds us together as, and that that reserve declines as we get older on the x-axis is time. What we think is that cancer and the cancer treatment itself changes that trajectory so that individuals are going to present aging related conditions, present with aging related conditions and die of, of aging related diseases at a much higher rate than what you would expect for the general population. So that's the general hypothesis. And why do we think that happens? That's in part when you actually look at, you know, the NIH convened a, a panel of experts to try to understand aging in the general population. Why does aging happen? Well, aging is essentially, you know, normal aging is maintained through these very important pillars. Um, you know, the more inflammation you have, the higher aging related disease burden, the more uh, macromolecular damage, the organ tissue damage there is, the higher the risk of um, accelerated aging. And then if you can hit the next slide, the next, um, and what you, can, what you can see is that if you overlay onto this cancer and its treatment with its multimodal approaches, whether it's chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, or bio or immunotherapy, it could really alter each of these pillars of the normal aging process. And why is this important? Because the more intensive the treatment it is, the more multimodal this treatment it is, the more likely it is to disrupt the basic fundamental processes that maintain normal, healthy aging. If you can advance to the next slide. So we're gonna think about outside the box kind of approach of how do we think about aging and are there other models of accelerated aging um, in the general population that have been well established, and can we use those models and approaches to study cancer patients and why they develop aging related diseases? So, let's take the, the concept of an astronaut. So, astronauts have been um, studied for many decades now, in part because we want to understand not what happens to them um, in the, during the immediate flight process, but what happens to them afterwards. So if you can hit the next slide. So if you take an astronaut, and the reality is, is that there are multiple risk factors that put this astronaut at risk for uh, premature aging-related conditions. And this is in large part driven by physiologic stressors that happen. These physiologic stressors happen in flight, whether they're direct related stressors, so microgravity, radiation, or indirect um, changes that happen in, 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 in space, inactivity, weight changes. And if you actually study these individuals before and after space flight, if you can hit the next part, what you will see is that many of them, when they come back to Earth, have these um, physiologic changes that are mimickers of aging. They have cognitive impairment, immune dysregulation, cardiac issues, anemias. They have marked exercise intolerance, muscle loss, bone loss, and they actually come back physiologically aged. Now they have an excellent reserve to go in to uh, space flight, so they recover. But let's think about that model of accelerated physiologic stressors and put that to the cancer patient. So if you can hit the next mark. What we see is that cancer patients also have multiple stressors that um, are there at the time of the cancer treatment. Uh, so they have baseline risk factors. They tend to be older. They may have a family history of specific conditions. Then we give them chemotherapy, radiation, biotherapy. That is a direct insult to the physiologic reserves of an individual. And then many of our patients are, um, have prolonged inactivity during their cancer treatment. There are weight changes. There are metabolic diseases that emerge. And in our patients, for example, who are undergoing bone marrow transplantation, many of them are in bed for weeks, if not months at a time. So there's prolonged bed rest. And in fact, when you actually overlay this on top of what we would expect in other accelerated physiologic stagings, if you can hit the next button, what you see is very similar physiologic changes in our patients. So that, what we think is that that is really the driver of why these patients are developing um, these health conditions. So if you can hit the next. So why transplant patients and why do we think that this 
um, is accelerated in these patients, especially so, in part because these are the patients who have been treated the most intensively. So many of our patients who go to bone marrow transplantation are initially diagnosed with the cancer. Often they will relapse from the cancer, and then if you can hit the next one, they will then be referred to a transplant as sort of the end um, and, and uh, sort of last um, ditch effort to try to cure them from their, uh, from their hematologic cancer. So the transplant itself is not without its um, uh, sort of treatment exposure. You have chemotherapy, radiation. And then after transplantation, there are unique complications that can develop. Some of these patients will relapse again after the transplant, so they need additional therapy. So if you can think about transplant, it's really the physiologically the most demanding type of treatment that you can give. So you would expect that in that case, you would have the highest amount of this aging related disease in this population. And in fact, Dr. Bhatia and others have actually shown, if you can hit the next slide, that when you look at these long-term survivors of transplantation, they are more than eight times more likely to be frail, which is really the end stage of aging, um, than their siblings. And if you can hit the next button. What does frailty mean in this group? Well, if you become frail, you have a much higher likelihood of dying and dying prematurely compared to someone who is not frail. So it's especially imperative for us to understand why this happens to some people and not to others, but more importantly, to try to understand the biologic mechanisms. Next slide. Most of the work that I just showed you right now is really focused on what happens to people long-term after cancer treatment. Next. What we're primarily interested in understanding is how do we get people into transplant in better shape? How do we prevent these issues from happening? How do we understand and make decisions upfront? Who is the person who's gonna get into trouble later on versus who's gonna skate through without any issues? So the work that we're talking about is really understanding the biology of aging during cancer treatment. Next. So when we, we've done some preliminary work looking at what are the markers of aging and how do they predict outcomes? And these markers of aging we've studied primarily before the cancer treatment is delivered. So what is the someone's physiologic health before you even start the treatment? How, how does it impact outcomes? So sarcopenia is another marker of aging where you, all of us, as we age, we lose about 1% um, of our muscle mass over time. And this is two different configurations of sarcopenia versus no sarcopenia. Next. You can use existing imaging studies like CT scans to look at the people's muscle and their muscle health. Um, and some of this, we can actually use existing imaging CT scans prior, prior to their cancer treatment and predict who has sarcopenia and who doesn't. Next slide. These are two images from two individuals who have the same age, same diagnosis, same gender, same body mass index. The only difference between the two of them, and this is a cross-sectional of the abdo abdominal muscles, is that one has sarcopenia, which is loss of muscle with aging, um, accelerated aging, and the other doesn't. How does this impact outcome? Well, patients who are sarcopenic before they start their treatment have substantially worse survival um, compared to those who are not sarcopenic. After adjusting for everything, including age, comorbidity burden, diabetes, hypertension, all the aging conditions, physiologic health, physiologic weakness and frailty are really important drivers. And you can identify this before someone actually goes to treatment. Not only is it associated with worse survival, next, it's associated with higher rates of ICU admissions, prolonged hospitalization, readmission, and non-relapse related mortality, next. So short of scanning every single person before they start the treatment, are there simple blood tests that we can actually do to understand where somebody is on that aging spectrum above and beyond their biological chronologic age? Because you could have two individuals 65 years of age who are going through treatment, but biologically they may be potentially very different. So there's an emerging concept called clonal hematopoiesis, and that essentially just means that all of us as we age, we all in our blood there are specific genetic mutations that develop and these expand over time. For most people, they don't really don't have much of an implication, but they can be surrogates of aging. And what I mean by that is biologic aging. Next. Uh, there are specific genes uh, that are altered in the blood that are highly correlated with who biologically is older versus another person. Next. And interestingly enough, plenty of work has sort of emerged recently to show that if you have these blood genetic alterations, 
that they're, you're associated with a higher risk of aging related diseases in the general population. Next. We've done some preliminary work in our population at City of Hope. I'm not going to get into it, to it too much time because I, I spent time in, in the beginning. But essentially to show that preliminarily, if you have this blood biomarker of aging before you go to your cancer treatment next, you have a, next, you have a much higher risk of non-relapse-related mortality, aging-related diseases such as subsequent cancers, respiratory failure, multi-organ failure. So again, a simple blood test after accounting for all the other normal modifiers of, of premature mortality can help identify who's going to get into trouble, not just during the, the transplant, but long after. Next. So the V Foundation is helping us to look at these specific genetic mutations in the blood in our patients going to transplantation. We had initially proposed doing the genetic analyses in about 1,300 patients, and we've expanded that to nearly 2,000 patients. Uh, we diagnosed with multiple myeloma and lymphoma. Next. Uh, we have done DNA extraction already in nearly all of them and have done the library prep and sequencing to help identify the genetic mutations in these individuals and over a thousand of them in just a year. Next. And we're doing innovative strategies where we're linking large databases from our electronic medical record using natural language processing, which is an advanced way of querying million, millions of, of records, and then linking those health outcomes and complications in our patients with the upfront genetic mutations that we're seeing in our patients. Next. Ultimately, as a just sort of just as an update, we've done over a thousand patients who've been sequenced to date. Uh, we anticipate completing the sequencing of the entire cohort by the year 2020, which would make it the largest cohort of patients that have been sequenced uh, in, in the cancer population. Next. Uh, we're ultimately integrating that into a risk prediction model to identify who's going to get into trouble before you even start your therapy, which is really where we want to go. Next. Uh, and then we're gonna explore additional associations with aging related biomarkers. Ultimately, what we want to do is we wanna be able to make personalized decisions upfront. What is the optimal strategy? It's not just about curing, but it's about thriving. Next. This work would not be possible with the fantastic team of investigators and collaborators, and obviously without the support of the V Foundation um, and the patients and their families uh, for their active participation. So thank you so much for your time, and I apologize for the glitches with the slides. No need to apologize at all. Thank you. That was really interesting. And I, I love the analogy to, um, to an astronaut and to what goes on in space. This makes it something we can all grab hold of and understand better. So thank you very much, Dr. Armenian, for your presentation.